Good evening. All of you. My name is Maria Popova, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Universe in Verse. And a great applause for our beautiful speakers. Now, this is going to be an evening of truth and beauty and more truth, celebrating science and the scientists who have taken us to where we are today through poetry. And tonight came together in a kind of weird confluence of very deliberate intention and a great many glorious serendipities. In November, Jen and I, Jen Benka, the executive director of the Academy of American Poets. Yes, thank you. A couple of days after the election, we decided we had to do something that both mobilized and gave solace um, in response to what we were seeing coming in from people and from what we ourselves were feeling. And so we organized a pop-up poetry reading that we called Verses for Hope, when we invited some of the great leaders of thought and spirit, artists, writers, musicians, and a lot of poets to read poems about muscular hope, whatever that meant to them, in the public square. We did it at Washington Square Park, and it all came together in about 36 hours. And to our astonishment, we had some phenomenal poets and readers come to read with us. We had more than 200 people show up in person and several thousand tuning in online. We just periscoped it off the phone. And at the end, a lot of people told us how unexpectedly redemptive and hope-restoring the experience had been to them. And of course, that's what poetry can do. It gives shape and voice to the amorphous, silent rage that we feel whenever freedom and justice and our values are at stake. But more than that, it adrenalizes not through outrage, but through radiance. Now, around the same time, I was reading the letters of the great biologist and writer Rachel Carson, who catalyzed the modern environmental movement with her 1962 book, Silent Spring. And in one of her letters to her beloved, Dorothy Freeman, Carson quoted a line that she said had emboldened her to speak such inconvenient truth to power, which she did, by the way, at great personal cost. She was first dismissed, then ridiculed, then outright attacked by everyone from the government to the agricultural industry. And yet she persisted. She persisted even though she was dying of cancer as she was doing this work. And the line that she quoted was this, to sin by silence when we should protest makes cowards out of men. Now, I won't belabor what it was like to read this in November, um, but uh, I had to find out where it came from, and I did some digging and finally found it in a forgotten 1914 poem titled Protest by the poet Ella Wheeler Wilcox. And my first thought was, wow, how astonishing that a poet can embolden a scientist to transform an entire society. And my second thought was, well, maybe it's not that surprising because, after all, poetry and science have a common root. They share a raw material, which is nature, the very thing that Rachel Carson set out to protect. Science probes the mysteries of nature for truth, and poetry mines them for truth of a different order, one that lives in the realm of meaning. Some of our most memorable and powerful poetic images and metaphors that have permeated our culture draw on poetry. Hope is a thing with feathers. Now, meanwhile, all the news kept coming in of terrible violence being done to both science and the arts. The Environmental Protection Agency, which had been founded as a direct consequence of Rachel Carson's work, was being dismantled. The National Endowment for the Arts, without whose grants some of the most beloved poets and other writers of the past many decades would have just toiled away at day jobs and not gotten to do the kind of work for which they are so beloved today, that was being defunded. Alternative facts became a thing. <laughs> And so I was extremely restless about all of this, like so many of us, and I was talking about it with my dear friend, Jana Levin, who's an astrophysicist and a writer of uncommonly poetic prose and also the director of sciences here at Pioneer Works. And several combinatorial conversations later, we decided, the three of us, Jana, Jen, and I, to do the universe in verse as a celebration of this common root of science and poetry, but also very much as a kind of elaborate protest against the silencing of science and the defunding of the arts. We decided to donate all the proceeds from the tickets that got you here to these two vital pulse beats of human life. So we're giving half to science, half to art, half to the Academy of American Poets. Thank you. That's all you. So 
half goes to the Academy of American Poets and the other half to the Natural Resources Defense Council, which I think is the most direct continuation of Rachel Carson's legacy. So thank you all for being here. And, and, and how astonishing, by the way, and how heartening to think that the seemingly esoteric intersection of science and poetry as protest has such an ardent fa fan base. There are 800 of us here in Adams and thousands more online on the live stream which was donated by Kickstarter Live, so very many thanks to Kickstarter. Thank you. And I have to say what a hope restoring meta experience tonight has been for me just seeing the evening come together because it's been the result of many people's goodwill. Every single person involved from the Grammy winning musician and the Pulitzer winning poet to the people on the camera and the filmmakers and photographers who made what you're about to see, everybody donated their time and talent because this is something that matters. And so as we launch into the celebration of poetry and science, I think of one of my great heroes, Mariah Mitchell, who was America's first woman astronomer, the first woman admitted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 1871, just after she became the first woman hired for a specialized non-domestic skill by the United States federal government, <laughs> she was hired as a computer of Venus, which sounds so wonderfully poetic, but was actually an extremely mathematically rigorous job. She was basically a one-woman GPS performing very complex celestial calculations that helped sailors navigate the globe. So right around that time, she wrote this in her diary. We especially need imagination and science. It is not all mathematics nor all logic, but somewhat beauty and poetry. Yes, Mariah Mitchell. Now, she trained the first class of women astronomers in this country at Vassar College, and she used to host at the Vassar College Observatory. I hear the Vassar alums somewhere out there. <laughs> she used to host what were known as dome parties, where the women would come together at night and write poems inspired by the cosmos and read them to one another, which is such a lovely thing to do. So my hope tonight is that we get to have a giant dome party here in Brooklyn, which is befitting because we're actually in the early stages of building an observatory right here at Pioneer Works, which is going to be New York City's first public observatory. Thank you. And we're dedicating it to Mariah Mitchell. And so here's to poetry and science and all the wonderfulness that exists between them. Now help me welcome my two collaborators in this. First, Jen Benka, the executive director of the Academy of American Poets. And after her, Jan Levin, Director of Science, is here at Pioneer Works. Welcome, Jan. Wow. I want to thank Maria Popova and Brain Pickings and Jan Levin and Pioneer Works for celebrating poetry and science. And I wanna thank uh, all of you for being here tonight and supporting us. At the Academy of American Poets, which is based here in New York City, we work to increase the audience for poetry. And one of the ways we do that is by helping to de demonstrate how the art form speaks to many different subjects and themes. Through our programs and publications, we bring poetry to tens of millions of readers in all 50 states and provide free resources to K-12 teachers inspiring the next generation with verse. We believe that reading poetry enriches all of our lives. Not only does poetry matter, poetry is matter. <laughs> Poems are physical sites of discovery lasting monuments of sculpted syntax, sense records of our humanity and documents of our profound failings may we never forget, and our greatest achievements may we celebrate. More people than ever before are coming to our website, poets.org, seeking out poems that speak to the, this moment in our country. In the past few months, poems about gun violence, the refugee crisis, racism, migration, and climate change have been among the most shared poems we've published. How fortunate we are to have poets as our guides. 
It's because poets play such an important role in our culture that in addition to celebrating science, we're also working hard to help advocate for the National Endowment for the Arts. <laughs> our, our friends at the NEA, we'll give it up for them. As Maria said, losing NEA fellowships for poets and funding for poetry and literary organizations would be detrimental to the art form in our country. So please visit us at poets.org where you can sign up for a poem a day and join many millions of individuals regularly reading poems and learn more about what you can do to help save the NEA. Thank you again for being here and now it's my pleasure to welcome Jana Levin. Um, I have to be clear, this is uh, definitely due to Maria and Jen. <laughs> um, I'm just here to open our home um, to their brilliance. And I cannot tell you how moved I am to see everybody here. Um, I think it's absolutely spectacular. Uh, science as a Pioneer Works is definitely guided by the belief and the premise that science is part of culture. And I have really, to see all of you come out in a swell like this is, is so important to us and, and uh, such a reminder um, that that is in fact a patent truth and we just have to believe in it. Um, I'm, I hope you will all come back from some of our other science events. <laughs> Don't forget about us after tonight. Uh, I'm thrilled to be reading a poem by Adrienne Rich and I also want to thank her son Pablo for being here tonight, the great poet San Pablo. So thank you for coming out. We're so honored. Um, the poem I'm reading um, is called Planetarium, and I want to mention that the dedication um, reads, uh, reads the following. Thinking of Caroline Herschel, 1750 to 1848, astronomer, sister of William, and others. And I just want to mention who Caroline Herschel is. And of course, I know this like I know most things from reading Maria Popova's blog, Brain Pickings. <laughs> Caroline Herschel was the first professional female astronomer. She was the first uh, woman ever elected to the Royal Academy, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Royal Astronomical Society in Britain alongside the mathematician Mary Somerville. Um, and and that was at the age of, I think, 83, but any, in any case, somewhere in her 80s. Her um, mother deemed her too ugly to marry, and, um, and so trained her to be a kind of servant to the family, um, the family of 11 siblings. She had um, a childhood disease which damaged one of her eyes and limited her stature to four foot three. Okay, as I move my mics to be more visible. <laughs> I'm not four foot three, people. Um, <laughs> And uh, she followed her beloved brother from Germany to um, England, um, where they became musicians first and then astronomers. And then she became this very um, active and, and, uh, and passionate um, astronomer. She discovered eight comets. And she also discovered a galaxy that's kind of resting near Andromeda. And this was before we even knew what galaxies were. Um, so she, she became a kind of icon, I guess you would say, and, and very respected by many of the great minds of her time. Um, so here is Planetarium. A woman in the shape of a monster. A monster in the shape of a woman. The skies are full of them. A woman in the snow, among the clocks and instruments or measuring the ground with poles. In her 98 years to discover eight comets. She whom the moon ruled, like us, levitating into the night sky, riding the polished lenses. Galaxies of women, they're doing penance for impetuousness, ribs chilled, in those spaces of the mind. And I, virile, precise, and absolutely certain. From the mad webs of Uranusburg, encountering the Nova, every impulse of light exploding. From the core, as life flies out of us, Tico whispering at last, let me not seem to have lived in vain. What we see, we see, and seeing is changing. The light that shrivels a mountain and leaves a man alive. Heartbeat of the pulsar, heart sweating through my body. The radio impulse pouring in from Taurus. I am bombarded yet, I stand. 
I have been standing all my life in the direct path of a battery of signals, the most accurately transmitted, most untranslatable language in the universe. I am a galactic cloud so deep, so involuted, that a light wave could take 15 years to travel through me, and has taken. I am an instrument in the shape of a woman, trying to translate the pulsations into images for the relief of the body and the reconstruction of the mind. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. So the first time I read this poem, I was very puzzled by why Hadrian Rich would choose to use pulsars out of all possible cosmic phenomena, because almost everything else in the poem is kind of general, but pulsars are very specific. And it wasn't until I read Jana's gorgeous new book, Black Hole Blues and Other Songs from Outer Space, that I understood why. So pulsars, the first pulsar was discovered in 1967, less than a year before this poem was written, by a 23-year-old astronomer named Jocelyn Bell. And there's a chapter in the book about the discovery which kind of reframed our understanding of the universe. Um, Jocelyn Bell was subsequently denied the Nobel Prize for the very discovery that she herself had made. And this being a rich poem, I like to think that in the dedication where she says, thinking about Caroline Herschel and others, she perhaps means and other women, and other undersung, unsung women in the history of science. So I have since liked to think that her mention of pulsars was a nod to Jocelyn Bell. Now, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, as she's known now, is very much active and around, and um, she edited, actually, she's been a huge proponent of the intersection of science and poetry. And about 10 years ago, she edited an anthology called Dark Matter, which is a collection of poems about science. And the interesting thing about poems about science is this. First of all, the canon of the good ones is far from infinite. And secondly, the vast majority of them come from professional poets who happen to have just a few poems about science in their otherwise vast body of work. There are very few poets who write a lot about science, um, a couple of whom you'll hear from tonight, and there are even fewer working scientists or people who were trained in science who went on to write poetry about science. And it was in Jocelyn Bell's anthology that I found one of them, her name was Rebecca Elson, and she was an astronomer who studied dark matter at Cambridge, then Harvard, then back to Cambridge. And she was a beautiful, beautiful poet and tragically died at only 39 of cancer. And uh, her collected body of work was published later um, as this little book called A Responsibility to Awe, which is a line from one of her poems about scientists having a responsibility to awe, which I think is such a beautiful thing. Now, Rebecca Elson was also one of the first scientists to work with data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And our next reader's father was one of the first engineers to work on the Hubble Space Telescope. Tracy K. Smith has a gorgeous new book. Yes, Tracy K. Smith fans! <laughs> She has a beautiful new book of poetry out called Life on Mars, which won the Pulitzer Prize. And she is here to read from it for us tonight. Please welcome Tracy K. Smith. Oh, good evening. Thank you, Maria. I'm so excited to be here and to celebrate these two different languages that the imagination speaks and to um, bring some of my vocabulary to um, the conversation. I'm going to read the last section of a poem um, called My God, It's Full of Stars. And some of you might recognize that title from Arthur C. Clarke's novel, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, or other people might recognize it as the opening line of the film, 2010. Not quite as majestic as Stanley Kubrick's 2001. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you a, just a tiny thing about the poem. It's a longish poem in um, numbered sections that be, it begins trying to bring a, a set of lyric terms to a view of this real mystery 
the universe that we belong to, that we are at home in, and yet such um, strangers of, in a way. And um, it was really exciting to think about, you know, cinematic language or language that had to do with, um, for me, the 60s and 70s view of the future that I grew up with as a kid. Um, but by, by the time I got to the end of the poem, I realized, oh, there is something private that I um, that I want to claim too, and it's this this memory of my father um, working on the optics of, for the Hubble for a, a part of my childhood. So I'd like to read just the last section of this poem. When my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said they operated like surgeons, scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room a clean cold and bright white. He'd read Larry Niven at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted and pink. These were the Reagan years when we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked, and his arms would rise as if he were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never-ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles married Lady Di. Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things. The decade changed. The first few pictures came back blurred, and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time, the optics jibed. We saw to the edge of all there is. So brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Now, our next reader has won multiple Grammy Awards, is a beautiful writer of memoir and essays, is one of very few women inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame, and is a musician whose music radiates enormous poetic richness. She will read for us a poem about Marie Curie, another Adrienne Rich poem. And as you might know, Marie Curie was not only the first woman to win the Nobel Prize, but also to this day the only scientist to have won two different Nobels in two different sciences, physics and chemistry. Please welcome the wonderful Roseanne Cash. Thank you. The preface I'm going to give to this poem may seem like a non sequitur, but bear with me for a minute. In 2007, I had brain surgery. I had um, malformation in my brain and my cerebellum was crushing my brain stem. And it was progressive and the headaches got worse and worse as time went on. So I went to doctors and they mis misdiagnosed me for 10 years until I could barely function. And a couple doctors told me my problem was that it was stress. Some doctors said it was hormones. Uh, one said it was atypical migraines. And then so I went the alternative route and I went to these new age healers who told me basically that it was my fault, that I, um, <laughs> I wore too many dark colors, <laughs> that um, my childhood issues were not resolved, that it was a past life problem. Um, so I researched my symptoms myself and I diagnosed myself. And so I went back to the doctor and she told me I was wrong and a few more years went by and the pain got worse. But I persisted. <laughs> so in 
So I finally found this neurologist who diagnosed me with the same thing I had diagnosed myself with several years before. And um, then I found a neurosurgeon. So science, facts, data, verifiable tests, my own persistence, and a guy who went to med school for 16 years cut into my brain, fixed me, and gave me back my life. So, I love him. <laughs> I love the scientific method, and I love being relentless because that saved my life. So, this poem by Adrian Rich, it distills something I think that all artists feel, that this, all creative people feel, that the source of their creativity comes from the same room as their deepest pain. So my brain surgery was not my deepest, it was my deepest physical pain, but it was not my deepest, you know, psychological pain. But um, it's a, it gave me a model that I refer to, persist and verify, persist and verify. And I'm always reminded that the power that we abdicate to others out of our insecurity, to, to others who insult us with their faux intuition or their authoritarian smugness, that comes back to hurt us so deeply. We suffer so much from that. But the power we wrest from our own certitude, that saves us. This is called, this is called Power by Adrian Rich. Living in the earth deposits of our history, today a backhoe divulged out of a crumbling flank of earth, one bottle, amber, perfect. A hundred-year-old cure for fever or melancholy. A tonic for living on this earth and the winners of this climate. Today I was reading about Marie Curie. She must have known she suffered from radiation sickness. Her body bombarded for years by the element she had purified. It seems she denied to the end the source of the cataracts on her eyes, the cracked and suppurating skin of her finger ends till she could no longer hold a test tube or a pencil. She died a famous woman denying her wounds, denying her wounds came from the same source as her power. Wow, wow, thank you, Roseanne. Now, our next reader is one of only four poets in history to have read in a United States presidential inauguration. She welcomed Barack Obama to the presidency with her song, Praise Song for the Day, written for the occasion, poem, not song. Um, and she is one of the chancellors of the Academy of American Poets. She's also a writer of beautiful essays about power and its many guises, um, race, identity, art, and much more. She's the author of a beautiful memoir called The Light of the World that I know has changed the lives of at least two people that I can see from where I'm standing. Um, and I can't see myself, so otherwise I would say three. Um, and she will read for us today one of her own poems. It is my great pleasure to welcome Elizabeth Alexander. Thank you, a vision, a vision. This is absolutely amazing. I find myself thinking of Mr. Biggs, my ninth grade biology teacher, who loved me very much, though I was a terrible biology student. <laughs> so perhaps he knew that one day this would happen. Um, 
rest in peace. Um, so um, this poem, The Venus Hot and Tot, um, I wrote in the, the late 1980s. I was reading about and learning about Georges Cuvier, a French scientist who I learned about through his experimentation on a Southern African woman named Sarah or Sarki Bartman. He uh, was interested in her anatomy. He was interested in her genitalia. He was interested along with many other people, and, and this to say that science is awesome, science is sometimes beautiful, sometimes science is terrible, and many, many, many people have died in the name of science and pseudoscience. So, so he experimented upon this Southern African woman, and his work uh, was designed to show that African women, all you needed to know about them to understand their essence was in their genitalia, in the same way that he believed that all you needed to know about European men would be understood by calibrating their brains. Stephen Jay, Jay Gould wrote about her after looking to see, to find Broca's brain uh, in a repository and found instead her remains, which were exhibited for decades and decades and decades in a jar in the Musée de l'Homme in France. When she was living for the 25 years uh, that she lived on this earth, she was brought from Southern Africa and she was exhibited in private balls and circuses, caged and naked, and became in the early part of the 19th century um, uh, a way that people would again uh, mark difference as a way to uh, uh, imagine superiority. So um, I, you would imagine, I, I, I was looking for and listening for her voice, and so that had to be in the poem, but what surprised me about writing the poem is that the first section asked to be written in the voice of Cuvier. The Venus Hottentot. One, Cuvier. Science, science, science. Everything is beautiful blown up beneath my glass. A drop of water swirls like marble. Colors dazzle insect wings. Ordinary crumbs become stalactites set in perfect angles of geometry I'd thought impossible. Few will ever see what I see through this microscope. Cranial measurements crowd my notebook pages and I am moving closer, close, to how these numbers signify aspects of national character. Her genitalia will float inside a labeled pickling jar in the Musée de l'Homme on a shelf above Broca's brain, the Venus Hottentot. Elegant facts await me. Small things in this world are mine. Two. There is unexpected sun today in London and the clouds that most days sift into this cage where I am working have dispersed. I am a black cutout against a captive blue sky, pivoting nude so the paying audience can view my naked buttocks. I am called Venus Hottentot. I left Cape Town with a promise of revenue, half the profits and my passage home a boon. Master's brother proposed the trip, the magistrate granted me leave. I would return to my family a duchess with watered silk dresses and money to grow food, rouge and powders in glass pots, silver scissors, a lorgnette, voile and tulle instead of flax, cerulean blue instead of indigo. My brother would devour sugar-studded non-pareils, pale taffy, damask plums. That was years ago. London's circuses are florid and filthy, swarming with cabbage-smelling citizens who stare and query, is it muscle, bone, or fat? My neighbor to the left is the sapient pig, the only scholar of his race. He plays at cards, tells time and fortunes by scraping his hooves. Behind me is Prince Carmi, who arches like a rubber tree and stares back at the crowd from under the crook of his knee. A professional animal trainer shouts my cues. There are singing mice here. The ball of Duchess du Barry. In the engraving, I lurch toward the beldams, mad-eyed, and they swoon. 
Men in capes and pince nez shield them. Tassels dance at my hips. In this newspaper lithograph, my buttocks are shown swollen and luminous as a planet. Monsieur Cuvier investigates between my legs, poking, prodding, sure of his hypothesis. I half expect him to pull silk scarves from inside me, paper poppies, then a rabbit. He complains at my scent and does not think I comprehend. But I speak English, I speak Dutch, I speak a little French as well, and languages Monsieur Cuvier will never know have names. Now I am bitter and now I am sick. I eat brown bread, drink rancid broth. I miss good sun, miss mother's sadza. My stomach is frequently queasy from mutton chops, pale potatoes, blood sausage. I was certain that this would be better than farm life. I am the family entrepreneur. But there are hours in every day to conjure my imaginary daughters in banana skirts and ostrich feather fans. Since my own genitals are public, I have made other parts private. In my silence, I possess mouth, larynx, brain in a single gesture. I rub my hair with lanolin and pose in profile like a painted Nubian archer, imagining gold leaf woven through my hair and diamonds. Observe the wordless odalisque. I have not forgotten my Hosa clicks. My flexible tongue and healthy mouth bewilder this man with his rotting teeth. If he were to let me rise up from this table, I'd spirit his knives and cut out his black heart. Seal it with science fluid inside a bell jar. Place it on a low shelf in a white man's museum so the whole world could see it was shriveled and hard, geometric, deformed, unnatural. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. One of my favorite poems of Elizabeth's is a kind of meta poem about what art is and what it does. And it's called, called Ars Poetica 100, I believe. And its final line is, and are we not of interest to each other? It's a line that gives me chills every time I think about it, and especially in the last few months for very obvious reasons, but it's also strangely the line that came to mind the first time I encountered Humans of New York, Brandon Stanton's incredible labor of love turned cultural phenomenon. And I think the reason why Humans of New York has enchanted and attracted millions and millions of people is that Brandon has accomplished something very difficult and very rare in our culture, which is to create a space of uncynical, compassionate curiosity about other human beings so that we may indeed become of interest to each other. Now, Brandon will read for us um, a poem by John Updike, who is better known as a novelist, but in fact started out as a poet and never stopped writing poetry, and is one of those few poets who have written extensively about science. He has a whole book called Facing Nature, uh, which is all poems about science, and tonight Brandon will read one about neutrinos. Please welcome Brandon Stanton. <laughs> I did something bad. James, can you please put it back to the slide that I was on? Thank you. Oh, I did the bad thing again. <laughs> okay, here we go. There we go. Thank you. See, I think I'll utilize the stool. Um, so I got a, a text from Maria, who I love. Maria is the greatest person ever. Yeah. So like, the cool thing, you guys know brain pickings. I'm sure a lot of you follow it if you're here. Yeah. So 
like the, the cool thing about Maria is that, like hanging out with her in person is like the exact same thing as reading her blog. <laughs> it's like you could be sitting there and you'd be like, oh, I had a horrible day. I stepped in some dog shit. And she'll be like, oh, that reminds me of something Galileo said to Henry Kissinger. You know, so she is just the coolest person. I, I tell her honestly, I think she's the smartest person I know. Um, and so she said, um, yeah, can you, can you help me with something? You know, I'm doing this, uh, this event, uh, the universe in verse, and she explained it. And she said, that's e it's easy. All you got to do is pick your favorite poem about a scientist. <laughs> and so I thought of the, the nine scientists I knew, and I thought of the 12 poems I knew, and <laughs> there wasn't any overlap. <laughs> Uh, so she said, I'll just pick one for you. <laughs> and in, in typical uh, Maria style, she didn't email it to me. She took a photo of a page in a book, because <laughs> that's how she does things. Um, and my poem is called Cosmic Gall by John Updike. Uh, I did a, a couple practice readings upstairs. I got three pieces of criticism, uh, which is go slower, uh, tr try to make a little eye contact, and Amanda Palmer said, you need to be way more emo, way more emo. <laughs> So as she said, it's earnest sadness, it's easy, just do it. <laughs> so I'm gonna read about something called neutrinos and try to be earnestly sad about it. <laughs> okay, so there's a uh, introductory quote that's very important to understanding this here. Um, Every second, hundreds of billions of these neutrinos pass through each square inch of our bodies, coming from above during the day and from below at night when the sun is shining on the other side of the earth. So that's important to remember as I read my neutrino poem. Okay. <laughs> neutrinos, they are very small. They have no charge and have no mass and do not interact at all. The earth is just a silly ball to them through which they simply pass, like dust maids down a drafty hall or photons through a sheet of glass. They snub the most exquisite gas, ignore the most substantial hall. Cold shoulder steel and sounding brass insult the stallion in its stall. In scoring barriers of class, infiltrate you and me. Like tall and painless guillotines, they fall down through our heads into the grass. At night they enter at Nepal and pierce the lover and his lass from underneath the bed. You call it wonderful, I call it crass. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. Now, our next poet, now our next reader who is a poet, belongs to that tiny peer group of maybe five poets with a very strong background in science. And uh, I first came upon her work in a somewhat unusual way. I was reading the letters of Carl Sagan, and in a letter from February of 1974, oh yeah, Carl Sagan fans, there should be many. <laughs> So in a letter from 1974, he was writing to his buddy Timothy Leary, who had just been thrown in prison for, shall we say, his empirical adventures in psychedelics. <laughs> and Sagan writes to him and sends him a poem. And he says, you have to check out this young Cornell poet. Her name is Diane Ackerman. This poem is not yet finished, so don't share it, but I think you're going to enjoy it. Now, as I later found out, Carl Sagan was on Diane's doctoral advisory committee, and the poem was eventually finished. It was included with about a dozen others in her book, The Planets, A Cosmic Pastoral, which is a suite of odes to all the planets in the solar system. And this was my first encounter 
familiar with Diane's work. She has since written a great deal more poetry, many essays, and several gorgeous books at the intersection of science and human life. And she is here with us tonight, which I am so pleased and grateful for. So please welcome Diane Ackerman. Thank you so much. I have always loved the way that science keeps throwing buckets of light into the dark corners of existence. And when I was 20, I was listening to Gustav Holst's extraordinary music, The Planets, and I was enchanted by the lyrical flights, but I was also puzzled by our need to imagine Venus as a goddess of love, or Mars as the bringer of war, just in order to find them captivating, when the physical reality of the planets was packed with rarities and picturesque landscapes and fresh metaphors. I took the universe literally as one verse, and so I decided to write a scientifically accurate book of poems about the planets. That was in 1970. It was considered very odd at the time <laughs> at Cornell. One of the critics there took me aside and said, what's a nice girl like you doing writing about amino acids? You know? <laughs> in 1970, the best NASA photo of Pluto was a tiny ball of light with an arrow pointing to it. <laughs> But as Maria said, I'd just entered Cornell and Carl had kindly agreed to be my, on my MFA and doctoral committees. God bless him for that because he opened a lot of doors for me to be able to study the sciences. But he also was my technical advisor and he made it possible to pour over NASA photos and maps and attend Voyager flybys. And he was someone who really believed that the universe wasn't knowable from only one vantage point and that the sciences and the humanities both were essential and had things to teach us. I also entered the Journalist in Space project, which you may remember was canceled after the Challenger tragedy, but I desperately wanted to go into orbit and so much farther. As a child, I'd fantasized about being a part of an itinerant band of extraterrestrial poets who, well, okay, maybe not only as a child. <laughs> who visited different solar systems and were reborn into each one, creating art as one sentient life form after another. This time around, I just happened to be a human on a sunny blue marble in our little local curve of space. Today, um, my work continues to include a lot of what people call science, I guess. I just think of it as nature. And it's my form of celebration and prayer and very much the way that I inquire about the world. The whole adventure of being alive is an extraordinary mystery trip. The world revealing itself and human nature revealing itself, very often thanks to some, the sciences, are seductive and startling. And that's always been fascinating enough to send words down my spine. So tonight, I'm going to read a little poem about our search for extraterrestrial life, since, of course, I hinted that I might still like to go, although I don't know if immigrants would be allowed to travel. So, you know. It's called We Are Listening. As our metal eyes wake to absolute night, where whispers fly from the beginning of time, we cup our ears to the heavens, we are listening on the volcanic rim of Flagstaff and in the fields beyond Boston in a great array that blooms like coral from the desert floor on high wire webs patrolled by computer spiders in Puerto Rico. We are listening for a sound beyond us, beyond sound, searching for a lighthouse in the breakwaters of our uncertainty, an electronic murmur, a bright, fragile I am small as tree frogs staking out one end of an endless swamp. We are listening through the longest night we can imagine, which dawns between the life and times of stars. Our voice trembles with its own electric. We who mood like iguanas, we who breathe sleep for a third of our lives, 
We who heat food to the steaminess of fresh prey and then feast with such good manners it grows cold. In mine gardens and on real verandas we are listening, wrapped among the Persian lilacs and the crickets, while radio telescopes roll their heads as if in anguish. With our scurrying minds and our lidless will and our lank floppy bodies and our galloping yens and our deep cosmic loneliness and our starbird hearts where love careens, we are listening, the small bipeds with the giant dreams. Thank you, Diane. This was astonishing. Now, I feel like it's my moral obligation to dispel any kind of illusion that I am somebody schooled in or even well-versed in poetry. Very far from it. In fact, I came to poetry embarrassingly late in life in an incident that is perhaps a little mortifying and therefore I must share it tonight. Um, <laughs> Some years ago, a very dear friend of mine, her name is Emily Levine, she's a comedian, um, actor, philosopher of science, at the time in her early 70s. She was visiting from the West Coast. And we went out for tea, we, it was a very warm spring day, we go to this packed coffee house in Chelsea, and we sit down and we start talking, and at some point Emily brings up poetry, which is one of her big loves. And at that point, I say something that only a person in their 20s would say, at least out loud, which is something to the effect of, meh, I don't really much care for or get poetry. So Emily's eyes open wide, she grips the edge of the table, slowly rises all 4.9 feet of her, and begins reciting a passage from T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. <laughs> At that point, my eyes open wide and I'm mesmerized. Now, bear in mind, Emily is a trained theater actor. She went to theater school with John Cleese and Lily Tomlin. They were in a little group, so she's performing this poem. And I'm looking and I look around and people are stopping mid-stride. People are putting their coffee down. And when she's done, 30 seconds later, she calmly sits back down and this packed New York City coffee house erupts into an applause. Now, Assuming you live in New York, you know this just does not happen. <laughs> and the passage that she recited is the one that contains the famous line, do I dare disturb the universe? And needless to say, on that day, my universe was permanently disturbed, and it was the beginning of my love of poetry, and I've spent all the years since making up for the lost years before that. Now, fast forward a number of years, Emily is now terminally ill, and she's meeting her mortality with enormous composure and a lot of poetry. She was recently giving an interview for Print Magazine, and the interviewer asked her, well, what do you mean you're okay with dying? Can you elaborate? And she said, well, I believe in reality. And I guess it helps to be a philosopher of science when you're facing mortality, because what she meant was she knows that her atoms will one day cease being her atoms and will just go back to being atoms, and that's that. And she finds enormous comfort in that. Now, in the time since Emily's diagnosis, I've been taking her in these little poetry getaways, little retreats where we rent a cottage someplace secluded and beautiful with a couple of friends, and we just spend two days reading poetry and cooking and reading more poetry. And we just came back from one in California. And this is where the great stroke of serendipity comes in and why I'm telling you this story. So Emily brought with her a poem to read that she said, a local poet had come up to her during one of her talks and they'd hit it off and the poet had given her this poem. Now, it turned out the poet was Jane Hirschfield, who is an extraordinarily well-known poet, one of my favorite poets. In fact, her book of Gravity and Angels is in my bed. I sleep, literally sleep, with her book. And Jen, Jen Benga, had told me just weeks before that that, that Jane Hirschfeld had written an original poem for the March for Science, which took place in Washington, D.C. yesterday but I hadn't yet seen it. I was hungry to see this poet, poem. And it turns out that was the poem that she gave Emily. So 
Emily read it and I recorded her on my iPhone. We record ourselves just as kind of personal mementos, but when I played the recording back, it was absolutely perfect because this poem is about the silencing of science and of nature, the silencing of the rivers and the birds and the oceans and the bees and the insects. And there we are in the California wilderness and you can hear behind Emily as she's reading the ocean and the wind and the birds and the insects and just couldn't have staged it any better. So I thought, okay, we, we have to do, we have to do something about this. And I emailed Jane Hirschfield and I said, so I sent her the recording and basically said, may we use this at the universe in verse? And she was so wonderful. I should say she's a Buddhist poet who writes very much about science. I mean, can't go wrong with that. You know, a wonderful human being, and she gave us wholehearted permission to use this tonight. So what you're going to hear is Emily Levine reading Jane Hirschfield's On the Fifth Day. On the Fifth Day by Jane Hirschfield. On the fifth day, the scientists who studied the rivers were forbidden to speak or to study the rivers. The scientists who studied the air were told not to speak of the air. And the ones who worked for the farmers were silenced. And the ones who worked for the bees. Someone from deep in the badlands began posting facts. The facts were told not to speak and were taken away. The facts, surprised to be taken, were silent. Now, it was only the rivers that spoke of the rivers, and only the wind that spoke of its bees, while the unpausing factual buds of the fruit trees continued to move toward their fruit. The silence spoke loudly of silence, and the rivers kept speaking of rivers, of boulders and air. In gravity, earless and tongueless, the untested rivers kept speaking. Bus drivers, shelf stalkers, code writers, machinists, accountants, lab techs, cellists kept speaking. They spoke the fifth day of silence. Wow. Wow. So, in the course of our correspondence about the recording, Jane Hirschfeld mentioned that she had just organized an initiative at the March for Science yesterday called Poets for Science, which is exactly what it sounds like. Some of the great poets of our time standing up for science, and she had gotten permission from 20 of them to print their poems about science on these giant self-standing seven-foot banners that were at the March. And in, in collaboration with the Wick Poetry Center at Kent State, by the way, um, and in this enormous act of extra generosity, she and the folks at WIC let us have some of these banners here tonight. Um, they're outside, you may have seen some of them. This poem on the fifth day is on one of them. The poem that Tracy read is on another. The poem that Jad will read later is on another. They're out there and they were hand delivered to us from DC this morning. So when you go and mingle and look at them, give these posters a little bow of respects because they have marched. <laughs> Uh, and so now, our next poem is also about somebody who's very dear to my heart and I suspect to the hearts of many people in the audience today. Somebody who has changed the way that science is written about. Somebody I consider the Dante of medicine. The late, great, sorely missed Oliver Sacks. Yes, a big round for Oliver. And the poem is by another great science writer, the late Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote this poem for Oliver's birthday in 1997. And the poem will be read by yet another great science writer. If you have read Oliver's memoir, which I will footnote with saying, and I don't say this lightly, it's one of probably three books in my entire life that have moved me this profoundly. There's a passage, a very moving passage, where he talks about finally falling in love toward the end of his life with a wonderful writer and photographer named Billy. Well, Billy is here with us tonight. Billy is Billy Hayes, who is himself a beautiful writer of essays, photographer, many books. Uh, most recently, he has his own memoir out called Insomniac City, 
New York, Oliver, and me. And it's this lyrical love letter to the city, to Oliver, and to love itself. Welcome, Billy Hayes. Thank you so much. Let me tell you something about Oliver Sacks. Oliver loved birthdays. When a close friend had a birthday or when I had a birthday, nothing delighted Oliver more than giving as a gift the element from the periodic table that matched your age. <laughs> I swear to God. So after we'd been together about a year, on my 49th birthday, I got a handwritten card and a box which contained, for my 49th birthday, a slab of indium. <laughs> and on my 54th birthday, the last birthday that we had together, Oliver very excitedly gave me Xenon which is number 54 in the periodic table, Xenon in the form of a flashlight. <laughs> Very romantic. <laughs> I loved it. Actually, there were four Xenon flashlights because he couldn't decide. <clears throat> <laughs> Oliver also loved celebrating his own birthday. And this was something that um, he was inspired by his friend and mentor, the poet W.H. Auden. And Auden once said to Oliver, one must celebrate one's birthday. So from age 50 to his last birthday, his 81st, a month before he died, Oliver would throw a party. And um, the guest list was very um, diverse, from former patients to friends, uh, members of the American Fern Society, uh, <laughs> the Mineral Club, and um, colleagues like the paleontologist, scientist, and writer Stephen Jay Gould. And uh, it was on Oliver's 64th birthday in 1997 that Stephen Jay Gould wrote a poem for Oliver Sacks. So this is uh, by Stephen Jay Gould for Oliver. This man who's in love with a cycad, but once could have starred in a bike ad. <laughs> If you've seen the cover of On the Move, you know why. <clears throat> this man who's in love with a cycad, but once could have starred in a bike ad. The king of multidiversity, hip, happy birthday. You exceed what old Freud, past head psych, had. One-legged, migrained, color-blinded, awakening on Mars and hat-minded, Oliver Sacks still lives life to the max. <laughs> while his swimming leaves dolphins behind it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Our next reader is another wonderful musician, and I must confess that his song, Fever Dream, was the soundtrack to my moving to New York. So, to some extent, Sam Beam, also known as Iron and Wine, is responsible for us being here tonight. Um, he is <laughs> going to read a poem, a very old sonnet from the 1920s by Edna St. Vincent Millay about Euclid. And the reason I chose it is that Euclid is a very interesting and very wonderful testament to how science works over time. Because on the one hand, he's celebrated as the father of geometry. The elements of Euclid is one of the most influential math texts of all time, if not the most influential. For centuries after his time, he lived around 300 BC. His way of geometry was the way we understood space. And not only in science, but also had enormous influence in the development of perspective and figurative drawing and architecture. So suffice it to say, this man changed how we think about the world. And of course, today, we know that there's such a thing as non-Euclidean geometry, whether we're talking about the curvature of space-time or the hyperbolic geometry of how coral reefs grow. And nonetheless, even non-Euclidean geometry uses Euclid as his reference point. So he's kind of a big deal. <laughs> but at the 
same time, Euclid had other scientific theories that are by today's standards bonkers. So he believed, for instance, that human vision worked by our eyes emitting rays, hitting objects to determine their shape, dimension, distance, size, and all that, and beaming information back to us about that. Kind of the way that the blind navigate the world with a stick touching objects. Now, of course, we know now that that's so not how vision works, but at the time, we knew nothing about the biology of the eye, we knew nothing about light and photons and any of that. And so here's this great mind who had this bonkers theory. And I think it reminds us two things. One, that incorrect theories are not a flaw of science, but a function of science. They're the rungs by which we climb the ladder of truth. But on the other hand, it also reminds us that even the most brilliant minds that leap humanity forward by centuries don't fully transcend their own time, don't fully transcend the limitations and myths and givens of their time, what is taken to be true, which I think is a very humbling awareness to have as we reflect on our own place in time and how many of the theories we have about what is true might turn out to be bonkers in a few millennia. So with that, please welcome Sam Beam. Settle down now, settle down. <laughs> A little too crazy for poetry tonight. I do want to say um, how fun it is to come to a room full of this many people just wanting to gather and listen to poetry. Whether we're doing it to say, you know, yeah, let, all right, okay, I'm sorry. Whatever, whatever the reason, whether it's to, you know, give a finger to whoever you want to give a finger to, or just say, you know, our way of fighting our fear is through warmth and wisdom. I think it's it's just I love coming to New York and doing these <laughs> these these uh, these groups with these poetry readings. It's just so fun. Um, thank you for all those kind words. I Jen called me up and said, "Can you please just say a few words about your?" your uh, relationship with science <laughs> or poetry. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I'll just say, you know, because I didn't really know who Euclid was, so I had to look it up. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I'll, I'll uh, spend some time talking about Euclid and, and um, inform the people, educate the people, and then... <laughs> I'm not sure you guys have any, have any more questions about who Euclid was. <laughs> so I'll talk about my uh, relationship with science, which is um, pass, passing and adversarial at best. Um, <laughs> mostly because I just like, you know, I like the words. The, the facts get in the way, as we all know. <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, I've always enjoyed the arts, the creative arts, um, and sci I wasn't the best student, but I always, I, you know, science has always been an interest to me, and I think most poets embrace science, they embrace everything about how the world works, whether you're talking about the facts um, of physical space or our emotional space. Um, uh, we, we tread in the same water, pushing through the fog for a, a, a sturdy place to stand. Um, and that's, um, that's kind of what this, this poem is about. Uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay was a um, poet and a playwright who was from Maine but lived in, this, in Manhattan for a long time, did a lot of work there. She was a scrappy early feminist and persister. Um, uh, and this, this poem was reaching back into the past to, to find um, someone who found, when looking around her and seeing a lot of people bantering ideas about what beauty is based on what they wanted it to be, what they imagined it could, you know, 
uh, it basically is a finger to Christ in Christianity. <laughs> things that, you know, are, are age-old, ancient things that we cling to, but this new... Uh, it's a different. It's a different. It's a different foothold. Science and religion, although they 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 shake hands a lot. Um, this was her way of saying science is beautiful as well, um, and it's okay to find footholds in that sand instead of always looking for beauty in the heavens. Uh, that's this is what um, this is basically about. Not to blow it for you. <laughs> That's all right. It's mercifully short. <laughs> Euclid alone has looked on beauty bare. Let all who prate of beauty hold their peace and lay them prone upon the earth and cease to ponder on themselves. The while they stare to ponder, uh, the while they stare at nothing, intricately drawn nowhere, in shapes of shifting lineage. Let geese gabble and hiss, but heroes seek release from dusty bondage into luminous air. Our binding hour, our blinding hour, O oh holy, terrible day, when first the shaft into his vision shone of light anatomized. Euclid alone has looked on beauty bare. Fortunate they who, though once only and then but far away, have heard her massive sandal set on stone. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, so we have something very, very, very special up next. Are there any Sarah Jones fans in the house? Yes. So if you don't yet know Sarah Jones, prepare for your world to be turned upside down. Sarah is a playwright, an actor, who does these incredible one-woman shows that address issues of social justice and human dignity with enormous sensitivity and nuance and subtlety and levity and gravity at once. And the way she does this is she has this cast of characters, about a dozen people of various ethnicities, ages, races, nationalities, genders, that she brings to life using her own body and her own voice, but in such a way that when she inhabits one of them, you really are no longer facing Sarah Jones, you're facing Lorraine Levine, the elderly Jewish New Yorker, or Nereida, the Dominican activist, or um, let's see, Habiba, the Middle Eastern scholar, or Rashid, the recovering philosophical rapper. Um, Sarah also has uh, a new podcast out that is one of my favorite new things on the internet. It's called Play Date with Sarah Jones, and she and her many characters go and have these amazing conversations about life with various interesting people. She started out with India Airy, and she has musicians, actors, activists, all kinds of people, and they talk about everything with these characters. Now, because Sarah is so unusual in, in the way she performs her art, it was very hard for me to choose a poem that was right for her. And I kept just not liking the ones that I was considering. And finally, and you know, the 11th hour, actually thanks to Jane Hirschfield. Jane Hirschfield told me about a new book by a poet named Campbell McGrath called XX, Poems About the 20th Century, Poems for the 20th Century, I believe, where he, for every year of the century, he takes um, a person, a discovery, or an invention, and writes a poem about that. So anyone from Einstein to George O'Keefe to the Hubble Space Telescope. And there's a poem in there about Jane Goodall, who is one of my great heroes, and also another scientist who was ridiculed for a long time before she came to do the transformative work that she did. She was called unscientific for giving names to the chimpanzees that she studied, and yet she went on to completely reformulate our understanding of consciousness, and her work paved the way for the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness, which was signed just a few years ago, so half a century after she began this work. 
Finally, recognizing that non-human animals are also conscious beings, which by the way, it's a status we still struggle to confer upon some of our fellow species under various regimes of oppression and bigotry. Um, and that's much of actually what Sarah combats with her work. So the poem was perfect. I sent it to her and I said, look, the poem is very long, but it's just so perfect. And Sarah sent me back just a photo response. And the photo was of her and Jane Goodall. And apparently she had just met Jane Goodall, who's also one of her heroes, two days before that. They were both honored at some kind of award ceremony. And we knew this was, this was it. This is the universe has spoken loudly and we have to do this. But Sarah had this vision of bringing the poem to life using her many characters, in part to highlight the importance of engaging with science across division lines in culture today and in part to speak to this kind of chorus of humanity aspect of Jane Goodall's work and its legacy in the world. Uh, now, neither of us could do what she envisioned. Sarah is in LA working on her podcast and other exciting projects, so originally she was just gonna record herself, but now we had to film all these characters and edit them and we just didn't know how to do it. So this is where I have to thank Alan Amato, who is a friend of Amanda's, Amanda Palmer's, a wonderful filmmaker, photographer in LA who did the heroic job of filming, producing, and editing what you're about to see in just about two days. An enormous gift to us tonight. So please give a big round of applause to Sarah Jones and Alan Amato. Thank you, Maria and Pioneer Works and everyone who made tonight possible. Thanks especially to the scientists whose advancements are allowing me to join you virtually. And I'm so honored to get to read an excerpt from Campbell McGrath's exquisite piece, Jane Goodall, 1961. Now, I recently had the great fortune to meet Jane just after her 83rd birthday, and I had brought along a few characters from my one-person shows. I think we all overwhelmed her with our admiration for her work, but they wanted to be here tonight as well. So you'll be hearing Campbell's words read not only in my voice, but also in the voice of Lorraine, my elderly friend who is proud to be older than Jane Goodall and told her so, as well as Ernestine, my environmentalist friend from the Caribbean who is just back from the Science March, and my friend Rashid, who not only loves science, but is also a recovering hip-hop addict who considers poetry to be his methadone. So he's grateful to all of you for having this event tonight, as am I. And now, an excerpt of Campbell McGrath's Jane Goodall, 1961. Our century, our life and times will be remembered not for its artistic glory or triumphs of technology, but for its incalculable losses, for rain-matted bodies at makeshift markets on the road to Kisangani, civets, dictics, monkeys, anteaters, elephants, apes, dead animals, vanished species, the Earth's ravishment by humankind, our kind, by you and by me, even as we recoil at the thought of ancient savagery, cannibalism in some tribal past, medieval tortures, our great-great-grandparents' embrace of slavery. So the future will hold us accountable for this Holocaust against our brothers and sisters. What makes us human makes us fellow creatures, creeping things, fauna of a fragile terrestrial biosphere, neither more nor less. All lives are consequential. There is no hierarchy of consciousness or intellect. To feel the warm, oxygenated exhalation of the jungle is to know life as the planet intended it. Morning fog above the forest is the Earth's imagination made literal, hovering and nourishing. Great trees are more humble and profound than we could ever be. Chimps are our veiled reflection in time's mirror, rough drafts, pots drawn early from the kiln. In a universe of vast unlikeness, a universe of voids and atoms and protozoa, we are first cousins, next of kin. What makes us human makes us forked branches on evolution's zygotic tree. <laughs> of course, giving them names was wrong. Sentimental, anthropomorphic, unscientific. But isn't that what we do? Name the world, create order in our heart's image. 
as surely as they gave to me a name composed of odor, posture, uncouth movements, my skin of repetitive khaki cloth, my long pale hair, a, a name, name composed, composed of, of habits and, and habitation. habitation. She, she who lives, lives in, in the strange, strange hard nest. nest. She, she who swims. She who watches from the peak. peak. Who sees, who sees our, our life in the forest as it has been, been for millions of years. Who bears witness to the abyss of its annihilation. She who comes to write, write our epitaph or to save us. us. Wow. Now, we have something else very special. We have a surprise reader who is not on the program and is somebody that we have been trying to get to Pioneer Works for a very long time, who comes from a long way away and is here with us tonight. She is one of the great installation and performance artists of our time, an amazing cross-pollinator of creative skills and arts. She's collaborated with anyone from weavers to jazz singers to poets. I am so pleased to have with us Anne Hamilton. Now, Anne will read for us a poem about one of the Harvard computers, the women who worked at the Harvard College Observatory at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century and who made phenomenal discoveries, important discoveries long before they were able to vote, including the star classification system that we use today. There's actually a great book about them out called The Glass Universe by Davis Sobel, who's with us in the audience tonight. Um, yes. So this poem, is about Henrietta Leavitt, who was one of the lead computers, and her calculations actually became the basis for Hubble's law, demonstrating that the universe is expanding. And uh, it's by a young poet nam named Anna Leahy, who I found out about through an artist friend. If you see on the cover, of this is the book cover, this beautiful cyanotype artwork comes from an artist named Leah Halloran, who was a resident here at Pioneer Works last year. Yes, a big round for Leah. And Anna is a colleague of Leah's at Chapman University, so Leah told me about this book, which is a collection of poems about the unsung and undersung women of history, and one of them is about Henrietta Levitt. So please welcome Anne Hamilton. Amazing, Maria. You know, the thing tonight, she's doing this whole thing without any notes. <laughs> well, how do you do that? <laughs> Hi, right, I'm so happy to be here tonight. Um, I don't really, I'm not from so far away. I flew in from Ohio this morning. <laughs> and uh, we believe in science and we believe in poetry, although it's not so obvious um, in the current administration in my state. <laughs> Um, I think what I wanted to say is that uh, in the address to what is one's relationship, what's my relationship to science and poetry, besides having faith in both, is that um, they begin with a hunch and they begin uh, maybe with a writer by putting a pencil or a pen down on a piece of paper. For a visual artist like me, it would be like standing in the incredible volume of this space and going, yes. For a scientist, it begins um, maybe with something that happens with chemistry or watching the incredible dance of the amoeba, which, and their swarmings and growings and dines and being ever fascinated by their systems. And, um, and so it's what ties us, it's that we move from what we know to what we don't know. And we need to be able to embrace in the culture everything we don't know and make it something we can know together. 
So the thing that's extraordinary that also Maria and Jen and Jana also do is they're threading us all together from these different disciplines and they're connecting the near and the far, which is what this poem is about. That without Henrietta, um, I think this is true, we would not really be able to measure the distances of the universe. It's true, right? And that it was her close observation of the changes in light that led her to understand um, that this was a way to actually understand the distance between things. And right now, an event like tonight is about um, making us all closer. And so Henrietta obviously understood that distance was also about nearness. And I think if we could all be so lucky to have um, Maria selecting our reading for us. <laughs> but you do that with your blog, that every week it comes out and it's like <gasps> one more gift because work happens because we, it's an act of finding and it's finding what you need. And we depend on our friends to hand us the footnote, to hand us the book, the poem that we need to read now. So this is the poem that I need to read now. And it's called The Habits of Light. And I need my glasses. <laughs> After Henrietta Leavitt, astronomer. The difference between luminosity and brightness is the difference between being and being perceived, between the energy emitted and the apparent magnitude. Oh. Oh, to be significant, to have some scope and scale, size and heat. Why not make that obvious, ostensible, stretch it out for all the world to see? Distance makes a world of difference. The universe is made of distance and of dust, more dust than star out there more crimson than cobalt from here. Looking, our eyes telling the truth slant through the almost nothing of the universe's finely grained mattering. Mm -hmm. So, I'm gonna... I'm going to break the rhythm here because I had one more thing I wanted to say. Actually, I wanted to start with this. Is that um, a couple of days ago in the New York Times, did you notice what was on the front page? Poetry. <laughs> the front page, there was a whole story about poetry. I called all my friends. I was so excited. I went out and bought 10 copies. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, science has had its own weekly session for a while. But now it's time to have it every day because science and poetry are every day and now I think we need to advocate for a poetry section. <laughs> And what was on the cover of that section, by the way, was not just poetry. The photograph headlining the cover of the New York Times was a photo of Amanda Palmer with her ukulele <laughs> at the recent Lincoln Center event by the Academy of American Poets, the 15th annual Poetry and the Creative Mind. If you haven't yet gone, go next year. It is a magical night. Artists, musicians reading poetry at Lincoln Center. Um, and so, okay, our next reading. Let me just say this. A long, long time ago, about 146 years ago to be precise, Erasmus Darwin, who was Charles Darwin's great-grandfather, I believe grandfather, did something very unusual, which is he published a book-length poem about science called The Botanic Garden with the intention of enchanting people who are not science literate with the exciting new science of the sexual reproduction of plants. <laughs> And it was a surprising success, and it was many people's first encounter with science. So in a way, our next reader has done something very similar. 
She has taken a popular art form of our time, radio, and used it to enchant the common reader, the common listener, with science. Jada Boomerad and Radio Lab. Yes. Yes. And I mean, Radiolab has really created a new aesthetic of how stories are told, not just about science, but stories on the radio. I mean, the, the legacy of Radiolab can be heard on almost every good podcast today, which is kind of extraordinary. And Jad will read for us a poem by Patty Ann Rogers, which is a kind of ode to the neglected but immensely important single-celled creatures. Please welcome Jad Abumrad. Hello, hello. Um, it's amazing to be here. Um, I gotta say, I, uh, I, um, it's always a funny thing when these moments we unfortunately all have to live through together, where uh, science gets politicized. Because um, the science that I grew up with, I am the product of two scientists, is, was profoundly unpolitical. My mother studied one protein for 35 years. <laughs> one single protein and like she showed me a rendering of this thing uh, pretty recently actually and it's this giant bulbous kind of pulsating thing with a big hook coming out of its butt <laughs> and it doesn't even really have a butt but that's the only way I can think to talk about it um, and it's like you look at this thing you're like you realize instantly like, this thing doesn't give a shit about us <laughs> It doesn't care if we want to know about it or if we choose to believe in it. It just is there. <laughs> and it will be there forever. And I, I find that comforting, I gotta say. I do. Because, you know, the, the fact that science, what scientists often do is they spend um, this incredible, they take this, it's, it's this incredibly valiant, sometimes thankless effort to understand things which uh, are so far outside our experience. So, with that in mind, I'm going to read a poem called Address the Archaeans, One Cell Creatures. Uh, Archaeans, uh, if you don't know, they are like a whole sort of wing of life that just if you go by biomass and, and population, they're just kicking our ass. They are so much more successful than us. So, this is Address the Archaeans, One Cell Creatures by Patty and Rogers. Although most are totally naked, and too scant for even the slightest color. And although they have no voice that I've ever heard for cry or song, they are nevertheless more than mirage, more than hallucination, more than falsehood. They have confronted sulfuric boiling black sea bottoms and stayed held on under 10 tons of polar ice, established themselves in dense salts and acids, survived eating metal ions. They are more committed than oblivion, more prolific than stars. Far too ancient for scripture, each one bears in its one cell, one text. The first wit of alpha, the first jot of bearing. Beneath the riling sun, the first nourishing of self, too lavish for saints, too trifling for baptism. They have existed throughout, never gaining girth enough to hold a firm hope of salvation. Too meager in heart for compassion, too lean for tears, less in substance than sacrifice. Not one has ever carried a cross anywhere. <laughs> and not one of their trillions has ever been given a tombstone. I've never noticed a lessening of light in the ceasing of any one of them. They are more mutable than mere breathing and vanishing, more mysterious than resurrection, too minimal for death. Thank you. Next up, we have, oh, it's me. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so some years ago, I was at a conference where Jad's counterpart at Radio Lab, Robert Krulwich, was also speaking, and Robert read as part of his talk a passage, or actually a whole poem, by a poet I had never heard of. Now, this is where we cue the reminder that I was poetry illiterate for a long time. And it turned out the poet that he read was one of the most beloved poets of the 20th century, recipient of the Nobel Prize. Her name was Wyszlowa Szymborska, she was a Polish poet. And I was so enchanted by that poem that I went out and I got all of her work and I promptly fell in love with it. And so I'm going to read a poem of hers about the number pi. And the reason I'm going to read this is that when I was growing up in Bulgaria, at some point it was determined that I was good at math, and I applied to the National Mathematics Gymnasium, and I was thrown into this kind of fire pit of intense mathematics for a couple of years, did the European Math Olympics, the whole thing. I mean, it was pretty brutal. And I think one thing that gave me comfort was the number pi. I became really obsessed with it, and I loved this idea that this thing that is so central to reality, I mean, pi is what makes a circle a circle. It's embedded in the very nature of reality. It's also, at the same time, an irrational number with an infinite number of digits after its decimal point. So every time a new digit is discovered, we know it's not the final one. There's more to know. And I loved this idea that in this climate of certainty and solutions and just the kind of rigor that we're immersed in, here's this elemental entity that contains within itself infinite possibility of discovery. So this is Pi by Vishlova Shimborska. The admirable number pi, 3.141, all the following digits are also initial, 5, 9, 2, because it never ends. It can be comprehended, 6, 5, 3, 5, at a glance, 8, 9, by calculation, 7, 9, or imagination, not even 3, 2, 3, 8, by wit, that is, by comparison, 4, 6, to anything else, 2, 6, 4, 3, in the world. The longest snake on earth calls it quits at about 40 feet. Likewise, snakes of myth and legend, though they may hold out a bit longer. The pageant of digits comprising the number pi doesn't stop at the page's edge. It goes on across the table, through the air, over a wall, a leaf, a bird's nest, clouds, straight into the sky, through all the bottomless, bloated heavens. Oh, how brief, a mouse's tail, a pigtail, is the tail of a comet. How feeble the star's ray bent by bumping up against space. Well, here we have 2, 3, 15, 300, 19, my phone number, your shirt size, the year, 1973, the sixth floor, the number of inhabitants, 65 cents, hip measurement, two fingers, a charade, a code in which we find, hail to thee, blight spirit, bird, thou never word, alongside ladies and gentlemen, no cause for alarm, as well as heaven and earth shall pass away, but not the number pi, oh no, nothing doing. It keeps right on with its rather remarkable five, its uncommonly fine eight, its far from final seven, nudging, always nudging, a sluggish eternity to continue. Vishleva <laughs> Shimborska. Now, our next and final speaker, is the brilliant Amanda Palmer, a musician of immense talent and ferocious originality, a connector of people and ideas, and a very, very dear friend. Now, some years ago, Amanda and I, I don't remember how, maybe Amanda will remember, we got to reading Vishlova Shimborska, and we have since read her poetry um, in public at some of Amanda's gigs and in private, and she's done some beautiful recordings for me for brain pickings of some of Shimborska's poems. And she actually also recorded the poem I mentioned at the beginning, the one that inspired Rachel Carson, Protest. So you can find Amanda's gorgeous reading of that on the internet. And so one of the most, I would say, wonderful things about Amanda is that she is somebody who takes the tiniest grain of possibility and explodes it into a universe of awesome so that it becomes the biggest, most beautiful, most expansive thing it can be. So that's what she did tonight. I thought she was just going to read a poem as 
I had in mind, but no, Amanda wasn't gonna read any old poem. Amanda was gonna read a new poem, and not just any new poem. It's a poem that her husband, Neil Gaiman, Woo! yes, Neil Gaiman, one of the great storytellers of our time, has written an original poem for us tonight, which is, yes, such a, tremendously generous gift, but also a kind of miraculous moment that we get to share, because how often do we get to see a work of art being born within a moment for an occasion and then just going out into the world and outliving us all. It's just gonna go on living after we're all gone. Now, the poem is about I'll only say, you may have picked up a kind of unspoken theme tonight, which is women and science and the history of women and science. And this poem, this poem might be the world's first feminist poem about the dawn of science. And I'll say this, we've all been taught, depending on what part of the world we come from, that the father of the scientific method is Galileo or Descartes or Francis Bacon, but Neil is here to remind us that actually the scientific method predates these men by millennia and has many founding mothers. Now, the poem is called The Mushroom Hunters, and I chose the image to accompany it very deliberately. This is a mushroom illustration by Beatrix Potter, who is best known to most people as the creator of Peter Rabbit. But what you might not know is, was that she was a very accomplished mycologist, and her scientific illustrations of mushrooms are still used to this day by scientists to identify mushroom species. Um, she actually wrote, she did experiments with spores, she wrote a paper that presented a kind of revolutionary theory of how lichens reproduce, this kind of dual hypothesis as a hybrid between fungi and algae, and at the time she was laughed off, and in fact she was not allowed to present her paper because scientific institutions like the Linnaean Society did not admit women at their meetings. And it was only decades later that the, her theory was proven correct when a man presented it. Um, but nonetheless, her legacy lives on. These illustrations of mushrooms are scientifically accurate and useful today, so I thought it was perfect to illustrate Neil's poem, which is such a lovely connection of everything that we have celebrated tonight, and therefore a perfect bow to the evening. So please welcome Amanda fucking Palmer. <laughs> Hi, uh, um, I'm also a tired mother. <laughs> I have a 19-month-old son, and I think the, mo the most amazing thing about um, Neil having written the poem for this event isn't just that he wrote it at all, but that he wrote it and finished it at three in the morning today. <laughs> and then the fucking baby would not go to sleep. And so <laughs> we, uh, you know, he like crept into bed at 3 a.m. and was like, can I read you my poem? And I was like, oh, okay, fine. I was like, we were both like blearily, uh, you know, lolling in bed. But um, I haven't told you this, Maria, um, in, a, in a beautiful confluence, our son, Ash, said his second word yesterday. The first word came last week, it was doll. Uh, yesterday he said moon. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm delirious. Uh, anyway, oh, before I read this poem, which, um, and Neil would have really loved to be here, but I mean, if he were here, he would probably be reading it himself and I would have had to write a poem, which is probably good. Um, he's teaching tonight at, uh, at Bard. He's teaching young college people how to write fantasy, which is kind of awesome. Um, so before I read this poem, I just wanna say thank you on behalf of all of us, I think, to it's been amazing thinking all night about art and science and how they're connected and how they sort of become ever more connected. But the, one of the things that they have in common is that there's just this, you know, 
these unique, unusual, bizarre things that don't necessarily have to be, and then all of a sudden, they are. And to me, Maria is one of those things. Like, she doesn't have to exist, and who the fuck knows where she came from, and how this happened. But she... <laughs> But she's here and she, and she does this thing. She does this bizarrely unique thing that's obviously so necessary. Otherwise all these people wouldn't be here. And um, I, I wrote, I was, I was sort of like jotting during, um, in, 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 the, in the spaces tonight, Maria, she is a locus and a joint of a swirling nurse to souls whose bandages and forceps are the poetry and the archived utterances of humankind. <laughs> That's you. Um, and, and what a beautiful bunch of connections tonight. And I, I have to say it is very strange to have a, chi a, a small child at this time because I feel like I'm constantly living in the intersection of hopefulness and hopelessness at, every five minutes. And, um, and Anne, who's so wonderful, I didn't even know she was her until I, that Marie explained that she was Anne of the Swings. And I was like, oh, you're Anne of the Swings. I saw the swings. <laughs> um, in, this, in this time, you know, where I just grew up assuming that time was progress right? What a naive thing to think, that the, that the more time goes by, the more we progress and the more we evolve. And um, how could it be, you know, like Anne was talking about, how could it possibly be that things become more divided? But then you see a night like tonight and, and there's, always, there's always a remedy. And I think tonight is the remedy. So, so here's, here's Neil's poem, and the final thing I'll say is um, it's interesting having a child with someone, you know, it's interesting being in a long, long-term relationship period. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then having a child, it gets even weirder. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the most interesting things about being in a long-term relationship and then having a child is you, the way you love somebody also evolves, it changes the way you see this person, the way you love them, the way you appreciate them, the way you can't stand them. <laughs> and, um, and lately, because of what's been happening out in the world, I've been loving Neil, not, not so much because he's the kind of person who will stay up until three in the morning when he has all sorts of things to do, to instead of like dashing off some sort of like chicken shit haiku, which he could have done, um, writes a two page poem that's impossible for me to read. But, uh, you know, not just because he's a good writer and a good artist, but lately, oh my God, because he's such a good feminist. And man, we, we need that. So, so here's this poem. Science, as you know, my little one, is the study of the nature and behavior of the universe. It's based on observation, on experiment and measurement, and the formulation of laws to describe the facts revealed. In the old times, they say, the men came already fitted with brains designed to follow flesh beasts at a run, to hurtle blindly into the unknown, and then to find their way back home when lost with a slain antelope to carry between them. Or on bad hunting days, nothing. The women who did not need to run down and pray had brains that spotted landmarks and made paths between them left at the thorn bush and across the scree and looked down in the bowl 
of the half-fallen tree because sometimes there are mushrooms. Before the flint club or flint butcher's tools, the first tool of all was a sling for the baby to keep our hands free and something to put the berries and the mushrooms in, the roots and the good leaves, the seeds and the crawlers. Then a flint pestle to smash, to crush, to grind or break. And sometimes the men chased the beasts into the deep woods and never came back. Some mushrooms will kill you, while some will show you gods, and some will feed the hunger in our bellies. Identify. Others will kill us if we eat them raw and kill us again if we cook them once, but if we boil them up in spring water, and pour the water away, and then boil them once more, and pour the water away. Only then can we eat them safely. Observe. Observe childbirth. Measure the swell of bellies and the shape of breasts. And through experience, discover how to bring babies safely into the world. Observe everything. And the mushroom hunters walk the ways they walk and watch the world and see what they observe. And some of them would thrive and lick their lips, while others clutched their stomachs and expired. So laws are made and handed down on what is safe. <coughs> Formulate. The tools we make to build our lives, our clothes, our food, our path home, all these things we base on observation, on experiment, on measurement, on truth. And science, you remember, is the study of the nature and behavior of the universe based on observation, experiment and measurement, and the formulation of laws to describe these facts. The race continues. An early scientist draws beasts upon the walls of caves to show her sister's children, now all fat on mushrooms and on berries, what would be safe to hunt? The men go running on after beasts. The scientists walk more slowly over to the brow of the hill and down to the water's edge and past the place where the red clay runs. They're carrying their babies in the slings they made, freeing their hands to pick the mushrooms. Ladies and gentlemen, Maria Popova. Oh. Thank you so much.
for coming. Please give our amazing readers a giant round of applause that you're already giving. And please stay and enjoy the space and the garden. And bear in mind that Pioneer Works is a not-for-profit art space, so if you enjoyed tonight, please support them so they can keep doing these magical evenings. And now, one thing that Mariah Mitchell, you should sit down, it would only be a second. One thing that Mariah Mitchell used to say to her students by way of life advice was, mingle the starlight with your eyes and your life won't be fretted by trifles which is such a beautiful poetic thing to say, but more to the point, we have outside telescopes, and although it's overcast, don't be shy, go take a look, you might be able to see something, and go mingle the starlight with your eyes. And thank you for coming.